the overwhelming topic that I've had probably the past three or four weeks is, is the market going to crash? Um, and it was highlighted from, the topic was highlighted from the R4 event that I attended. It was um, reinforced again at our reg Northeast Regional meeting with Remax as to, you know, where is housing going? And I know, um, you know, we're so in the day-to-day -day operation of the market, we don't look at the bigger picture. We don't take a, a 5,000 or a 50,000 uh, foot view down at what's going on. So <clears throat> with that said, the first thing I wanna do is, is share my opinion. And my opinion is that the market is not going to have a, uh, a crash or a bubble burst. And I'm gonna go through some of the reasons, but I respect this group so much that I wanna to put together a list of, you know, why might the market, you know, adjust downward and what's gonna keep the market going and how is the market now different than it was six years or, or, or actually 12, 13 years ago now um, when the market kind of fell out from underneath us? And if we've been in the business for a number of years or if you lived on planet Earth for a number of years and you recall people talking about the market crashing, I want to give you some insight into what I feel and what the experts feel. And not only do I want to give you why we feel, but I want to give you data to back it up, okay? Because we, you know, there may be, you know, by the, by the time we're all done here, there may be 100, 150 people on this call with, you know, managers doing it through office meetings. But that 150 people can literally influence probably 10,000 people. Okay, so this is a really important subject. <clears throat> um, I am saying that I don't think, you know, I, I feel the frothiness of the market, but I don't think we're in a bubble. I think stock market might be more of a bubble because that's a financial asset that people are going in or out of. And the housing is something where, you know, it, it's one of our basic needs. Are we going to stop eating because, because food costs go up or are we still going to suck it up and buy food? We're still going to buy food. We still need housing, okay? And it's still, even in the grand scheme of things with interest rates going up and it feeling frothy, I don't think it's a bubble. Um, I would like to get some input from everybody on the call as to why do you think it's um, why do you think it's a let me see what I have first here if it's the bubble or the not bubble here on my list. So why why is why, why can we feel that demand will be strong and it's not a bubble? Okay, I put inventory is low. I actually put inflation as a cause for it not being a bubble. Okay. Still relatively historical low rates. Housing st starts have not yet kept, haven't kept up with the population growth. Millennials are buying at record highs. Homeowner equity levels are at historic highs. I'm gonna put this down here and, I, and this is gonna be within a few points. 40% of owners have no mortgage. 58% positive equity and 2%, it's actually under 2% are underwater. So with negative, equ negative equity, okay? I'll just put negative equity. There is less speculative buying than there was in 2008 or any other, any other bubbles. Um, homeowners, and this is from NAR, Homeowners on average uh, in 2021 gained 56,700 in equity. It's a NAR stat. Um, what, what, what other things do we see that are, are going to be boosting the market into the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months? Rob, I would add two more things to your Rob. list. Sorry. Uh -oh. And, and, and uh, I, I just, you know, because I want, you know, we're, we're such a, a, a large family now across several states. If you can just say who you are and what office you're from before you make a comment, I'd really appreciate that. This so is ahead. Terry from Remax One Mama Junction. Yes. So I, I just wanted to add a couple more things to your list. This is really good. Um, I think we have to keep in mind the low unemployment rates. So the employment sector is still very healthy. And also, and I'm sure Bruce can add to this, 
mortgages are much healthier. They're not those subprime, um, they're not in a subprime situation that we were back in um, 2008. Sharon, not only are you right with the unemployment, but the, the thing that's actually, even though that's really important, earnings per household are up significantly. So earnings are up as well. So if you have a year over year increase in earnings, that that almost counteracts unemployment anyway. But the fact that unemployment's down and there's more earnings, that's what's exasperating the whole inflationary piece because people have money, especially okay, so, post pandemic. So er, Sharon, thank you. Low unemployment, responsible mortgage underwriting, um, Lots of cash in the money supply. So the, the government has put a lot more liquidity in the market. Um, and liquidity in the economy, I'll put that. What, what, what else is going for us before we figure out what, what, the, uh, what the potential risks are? So uh, Rob, it's Fazio over here in Florida. Okay, Fazio, what do you think? So, hi. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing here in Florida is the ability for second homeowners to be able to have funds to be able to do uh, investment properties because they um, are a little bit more lenient now and stricter with 1031s and hard money loans. I've seen an influx of investment properties for people to either buy, flip, and or turn into Airbnb. So if I to Bruce's point, you see an increase in salaries, people using that money because one, they're scared to leave it in the bank. So the best investment for them to do is turn around and see what the real estate market is doing and turn it around and, and um, put it into real estate. That's I'm seeing a huge trajectory going up in, um, in that area, especially for Florida and people having dual homes from two different states. Okay. What what um... just to add a little color to that, Rob? In 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 the effort to stay with what you phrased as responsible lending, to to Fozzie's point, the 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 mortgage house finance agency they changed all the second home loan level price adjustments. So the pricing now for second homes has gone through the roof, which is making people have to do these Airbnbs as investment properties because investment properties require a little bit more money down. So that market's still gonna be there, but it is gonna be more for people to have more resources. Typically you could buy a second home as low as 10% down. Now there's almost four points worth of add-ons to do that. So most of the people that were in that 10% down kind of, oh, maybe I'll invest in a second home and Airbnb it anyway, those are kind of going out of the market and the investment piece is coming in. So even as that market grows to her point, the it's identifying the right buyers that should be in that market, or at least Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which ultimately are kind of covered by the government. They're not getting involved in that. They're making, they're allowing the, the markets to absorb that product, which is very responsible because if you get into everybody buying second homes with 10% down and something goes wrong, they're going to bail in two seconds. Whereas investors have a longer play because there's more equity put in the property. And, and Bruce and Bruce Fazia, all of everybody that's been comments, some of these are both positives and risks in my opinion. So um, I put uh, liquidity, earnings are increasing for your um, Main Street employees, not just your Wall Street people. Um, investors, Airbnbs, Bruce, that's a, a, a positive that, and it's also a, a negative in my opinion. It's a positive for the housing market because they're requiring more money to come down, makes it more stable, but it's also a negative because it might eliminate some, some extra buyers from being in a particular market. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely a little bit of a negative too. But there's also, you know, there's so many buyers that really hasn't impacted it yet. So it doesn't matter, you know, because there's multiple offers, a lot of buyers, more, not enough inventory. Um, duplicating a home or rebuilding a home is expensive. Supplies are high, right? <laughs> and the permitting pr process is is long and expensive. So if you ever tried to like rebuild something and you have to comply with all the current codes, like, you know, ADA, environmental, it's, you know, it's really, you can't build the same home that's there because it's generally going to be a non-conforming um, grandfathered use. Um, land is scarce. That's always what something that real estate has going for it, right? Wall Street can print additional shares of stock. Land is fixed. I mean, now we're talking about the metaverse because we, we ran out of land. Um, anything else that is voting really well for why we're not in for a bubble? Um, Charon or Maria from the uh, regional meeting, I know Lindsay gave us some really strong statistics and I just can't recall them off the top of my head. Do you re remember any of those? 
Well, I don't have my notes with me, but I have a question or a statement, and here's Maria, you froze. We'll come back to you when you the are. sales that have been going through are for multi generational living, where now the um, the the buyers are also including their parents to come and live with them. So, do you see that, Bruce, where they're pooling monies together? So that's another. Event. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know that that's. I mean, we've seen it, but I don't know that it's like a trend that we've seen a lot of or anything. No. Okay. But I, I think what Rob said is a really good point about things being regional too. Like, you know, it could be going on in a market where there's more of, you know, more of that, like you're in retirement okay. in county, you know, I think it's more of that. I'm sorry, Bruce. I said, I haven't seen it to where it's a trend or anything, but you know, we've seen it, but I think maybe that's more what Rob is alluding to. I think when we look at things regionally, you know, if you're in a more, you know, if there's a lot of adult living or different types of homes or different markets, then, then you might see that, but we don't, that's not like a sector of our industry that we're seeing a lot okay. of. No. All right. All right. So, so um, let's see. Any, any, anybody else have any? Well, I'm uh, opening. I'm opening the staff file. Okay. Now, um, this is a good point where I can see if Mr. Jay Latangio is on, or anybody that recently attended the Jeff Otto um, market update. If you want to think about what Mr. Otto had said. I am. What's hey, up, Rob? How are you? I'm great. How you so, doing? So yeah, today? I just did. Jeffrey, uh, you know, doing all right. Just came in from Salt Lake City. A Burl Workman success. Very seven, good. Out in Salt Lake. Um, so yeah, the the auto report was good. You know, I mean, we don't in the in the short term for like this year. There's it, it didn't seem to think he didn't seem to think that there was much to worry about because we have a normalization that's going to need to take place, okay, in terms of the number of houses we have available, which is at record lows, unsold inventory, and, and active listings are down 20% from a year ago, right? And now we still have, as Bruce was pointing out, all these, all these buyers that are still on the market, and those people who've made the decision to buy are not going to not buy. So we probably have six months, eight months, the rest of the year for that to kind of level out and equal out, because what do we know now? We know now that we have record low unemployment and like Maria pointed out, it's regional. And so what you saw happen during the pandemic was this big wave come out from New York City and go all the way to Warren County, go all the way down to Atlantic and Burlington counties. And that wave, because New York has opened back up, is kind of moving back towards New York City. So, you know, central New Jersey it shouldn't really be affected too much. Okay. Another component to that, and this is again for the Jersey market, um, is, you know, our proximity to New York City is really what determines our market and what our area market is. And because so many people are looking to get out of New York City, you know, say whatever, there's 9 million people that live in New York City and a million of them, of them have decided due to this pandemic, that they're getting the hell out of there, which I know that that's what we see here in Middlesex County, Middlesex Union, Somerset counties. Um, you know, it's going to take a while for the market to absorb um, that immigrant, that migration of people out of New York into northern New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, the other thing that, if, if I remember correctly from stats we were one of the later you know later states to come out of this whole economic you know the great recession kind of thing and so new jersey doesn't tend to be on the cutting edge of of downturns per se you know um and and the other thing he managed to talk about the difficulty and what the recessionary impact is is this layering of issues whether it's okay hey we've got the pandemic we're finally getting to the point where we're accepting that it's just going to be around but but they're you know economically speaking it was it was very tumultuous and, and there was a lot of turmoil but we have a record in inflation b we have the fed moving up interest rates so obviously that's going to tamp down on the people who who can have the affordability complex am i still on yeah, we, we can hear you. Jay, you're, you're, you, we lost your audio now. You're just muted, Jay. Just unmute. Shit. 
All right, good, Jay. We can hear you now. Um, and, and, and so, like I said, for New Jersey, we don't really have that much to worry about for the next year or so. Um, you know, obviously, it's a great time to sell. So getting that inventory out there, and that's really what I've been telling my people, is, listen, this is we're at the peak of the market. So get if you're going to sell a house, now is the time to sell it. There's plenty of buyers out there. So let's get it on the market and get it sold. We have about an eight-month window, so we are running out of time to hit, hit the top of the market, you know what I mean? Because the top of the market seems to have been achieved, you know, August, September of last year really is when it was the hottest. We don't have as many, you know, 25 and 30, um, 30 offer properties out there. They're, you know, we're now down to like 14 to 15, you know, on most properties, at least in Middlesex County. Um, so you can kind of see the wave has occurred and it's kind of rolling back now that New York City's back open but there's still going to be a lot of pressure um, because we have so many buyers who are qualified and, and, and want to get mortgages and want to try to take advantage of these record lows in, in, in mortgage rates. Oh, so yeah. So what he was talking about with the recessionary pressure, and this is what I love, you know, it's mostly the buyers who hope that there's this bubble that's coming. Okay. And the reality of the economic indicators is, is it's, it's not really a bubble here in New Jersey in terms of economically speaking. There's, there's just too many other components, as we've talked about, that just aren't there. One of which is, you know, um, subprime lending isn't, isn't out there now. So we don't have people who are, um, you know, over leveraged in their property. And, and therefore, we're not going to have that great underpinning of 2007, 2008. And like I said, most of these people who are predicting um, that there's a bubble going on right now um, are buyers who hope that there's a bubble, even though there may not be, right? Um, and the reality is we don't have crystal balls, but what we want to try to do is look at what the economic indicators are, which is what the whole auto report was about, was looking at what's coming down the road. So through this year, we said that should probably have about a 10% increase in property values in, in New Jersey per se. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Florida market as much. Um, 2023, he's about 2%. And then in 2024, there may be a minus 5%, you know, in terms of property values. But again, that's just a plateauing. That's no bubble, if that makes sense to anybody, which is kind of the way that he sees it over the next couple of years. Um, you know, part of the reason I participate in it is so that I can obviously advise my clients as to what's going on because I have lots of, buy. oh, it's a bubble. No, it's not a bubble. Get, buy the house now. It's going up 10%. Okay, at least get, get a hold of it. Now, if you look statistically, the last two years, property values have increased 27%. In tw they went up 12% in 2020. They went up 15% in 2021. Okay, we get another 10%. That's a lot of value, as Rob was just pointing out, in terms of people not being underwater. Um, so the people who are trying to say that there's a bubble going on are the people who are wishing that there's a bubble going on. It's not the reality of the marketplace that so, I, I've seen from all the indicators. So make Jay, Jay it, make, it makes a, a lot of sense. Now, let me ask you, like being in the business like and going through some cycles here, from a practitioner, doesn't it feel a little bit unsustainable, Jay? What is going on oh, now? One hundred percent. And it's, and it's I think one hundred percent. And I think I think I mean, we having twenty five offers on one property. You know how many properties are available in Piscataway between two hundred fifty and four hundred thousand? There's five properties available in Piscataway right now, which is which is just nothing. There's no inventory. And, and any offer, you know, and whatever. How much for for Brian? I've had to write offers on ten different properties. So so you know Jay, I mean? so, so so Jay, for for being in the business, like w the passion that you're talking about, right? About how it's frenzied. There's no inventory. It's unsustainable. Okay, I think a lot of us um, extrapolate those facts into the fact that we we say there must be a bubble coming because this isn't sustainable. But when we add the facts up, okay. I think it's going to be a soft landing because of all these facts. Like, you know, we have, you know, still have low inventory. We still have excessive buyer demand. The public knows that interest rates are going up. The Fed has been telling us this, you know, um, all these things here make me and you as being in the industry, looking at this insanity, say that there must be a bubble coming. 
But I think if we take three steps back or we, we look from, you know, 5,200 feet up downward, we see that, you know what, um, the likelihood of a bubble of a major repricing of assets in real estate in the next two years is very, very minimal. Okay, based on the facts that we have here. Now, going back to the um, the, the reasons why- Hey Rob, hey Rob to, to that point, even if there is a little bit of a bubble, 27% add another, that's 37% increase in property values over the course of three years is a pretty significant increase, is it not? It is, I think so. Yep. The, I mean, does that make sense to you? The, that, that okay, even if it if it comes back five percent, that's still you're still up thirty percent on the value of your home in <laughs> three or four years. I mean, that's still a much. Can I, can I in quick? Yes, go ahead, Ron. Ron Piccolo from South Florida. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, we talked about not enough properties on the market. Uh, if you look on MLS, true, but I subscribe to a for sale by owner. And also, there's expired listings out there from a year ago that are, again, the for sale by owner, get almost, well, I get it every day, seven days a week. There's always 11, 15, 20 properties on there that for sale by owners are selling. So we're working with a buyer now. Unfortunately, it's an FHA buyer. Uh, so instead of looking on MLS, which we can't find anything anyway, we're going to hit for sale by owners and see if they'll pay us two and a half or three percent commission. There are listings out there, so there are more properties out there. You just have to go find them, and you have to find them through the expires and through the FISBOs. So, so Ron, I don't Ron, think you know. So, so Ron, does that push you in the cat in the camp of we're in a bubble or we're not in a bubble? I don't think we're in a bubble. Okay, I I, I think that when we look at these lists. I think that the overwhelming um, evidence is that we're not in a bubble. And when, you know, Ron, you or Jay talk about a five or even a 10% price adjustment, that's, that in my opinion is not a bubble, okay? A normal market goes up and down a little bit, right? If it continues to go up unabated, then that's gonna create the probability of a, of a bigger bubble to burst, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I don't. I I just don't feel like you know. There's. I, I understand the market. I've been in this business a long time. I've been through the, the 07 and I've been through '94 and '98 market when it was crazy. But uh, 07 and 08. I mean, that was a bubble. I mean, that was a mistake by the government with these uh, interest only loans. But uh, right now, it's it is what it is. We have to deal with it. But there are ways to, to help buyers find properties. And there are ways to get listings. You just have to go out and find them. So I, you know, I personally, I don't think we're in, we're in this kind of a bubble that you're talking about. But I think, uh, you know, I think there's going to be plenty of uh, properties out there if you search for them. So, so I think there's uh, another piece, Rob, to the bubble part that when you said earlier, the fact that there's a large down payment being required isn't necessarily a good thing. The reason it's not a problem right now is because there's no need for that because there's so many buyers, right? There are investors and people that do have the resources to put more down. But by not having the product, Ron, I would challenge that it wasn't about interest only. It was about no down payment loans that really created the problem last time. People had no equity. So when you have these second mortgage products or when you have somebody put in the chat about the rental market, it's huge. But the people that are buying these properties that are making that have to put more money down, it prevents them having to unload it later you know, to, to be able to hurt themselves. They could still put those houses back into the market without having loans not performed. So there's yeah. there's a almost like a safety net on, on the segment of that business that's there that wasn't there last time right. for what that's worth. And, and Bruce, there, there needs to be risk put into the market because if the market was risk-free, it would continue to go up unabated. Um, and, and you'll find the product. What's interesting, Rob, is the reason that risk was taken away right now is because they don't need it there because there's so many people. And then you'll find that if the market changes and that risk needs to be there, guess what, guys? They're going to develop product to help move the market again anyway. But right now, it's really helpful because it, it doesn't hurt that, that balance. And the other thing I want to mention that's really important, you know, the Fed's definitely raising rates. But what I want to make very clear to everybody, the Fed doesn't raise long-term mortgage rates. The Fed raises the short-term rate. 
they're raising like your two and your three and your these shorter term bonds. And what happens sometimes is as these bonds start to become less valuable to investors, believe it or not, the institutional money, the long term money becomes more valuable. You can actually see rates drop a little bit. They're definitely going to go up until inflation gets under control, but you can see the long term rates come down because they're a safer investment than some of these short term options for institutions. So rates are really not going to have as much to do with this as everybody thinks because earnings and all the other, the rates are almost, I know it changes buying power, but it doesn't matter. There's so much buying power out there. It doesn't make a difference. Is anybody on this, on this meeting uh, have a mortgage taken out in the late 70, like 77 to 81? Anybody on this call have a mortgage taken out in that time period? So I know my, my parents bought a place down. That's by good Long news. <laughs> My parents bought a place down by Long Beach Island, and they they put a, uh, a binder on it in the end of 1979, and they closed on it in 81 in um, the summer of 80, like nine months later. The interest rates went from, oh, geez, I want to say like 12 to 18 or 19 percent. That house they they put a deposit on was like fifty thousand. By the time they closed, they were selling them for eighty thousand. A year later than that, they were selling them for one hundred and ten thousand, then one hundred and thirty. And every every year they would go up twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, and that's because there was inflation and interest rates were high. So if there's inflation, okay, that's going to you know support house pricing. Okay, I think like. A lot of this discussion about inflation at a 40-year high being bad, it's really bad for you if you're on a fixed income. It's really bad if you have your money in the bank getting 1%, but it's not bad if you have financial assets because those, those are items that appreciate, okay? That's a hedge against inflation, and that to me is a huge positive to support housing, okay? So I'm glad nobody was in the housing market then, but we all heard the stories from our parents or our grandparents about interest mortgage rates being 12, 15, 18%, like a credit card. But when it was like that, house prices were going up high. So if you can borrow at 12 and appreciate at 20, you had an 8% margin, you'd do that all day long. So um, inflation is, it goes on both sides, but I think it's more of a positive. Um, Something that I think is part of that layered risk is geopolitical events, right? Like who, who expected like the possibility of being on the verge of World War III with Russia invading one of its uh, former country or former alliances from the United Soviet in such a brutal way that it's got the whole world turned against them. You know, there's maybe domestic policies and events that go on that might, you know, uh, trip up the housing market. Um, I think there has to be at some point a recession and a recession is two quarters of negative growth. That's all a recession is, right, Bruce? The technical definition? Yeah, yeah. And, and also it's, you know, inflation is not gonna be under control for probably a couple of years. I mean, it doesn't doesn't happen overnight. It, it you know, it, it takes some time. So it'll, you know. So, so Bruce, you the know Fed, the Fed, the biggest thing the Fed's got all this debt, they have 9 trillion in, in, in bonds out right now. The, the big thing is how much they're gonna roll these things. I mean, so, that was the one thing the Fed said yesterday that kind of you know, left the, the, the mortgage market a little uncertain was they talked about writing down the balance sheet. And what that means is that they're going to start tapering. They're not going to buy all these mortgage-backed securities. So they have to be very careful with that because if the liquidity from all the markets doesn't come in and buy the bonds, you could see things unravel a little bit. But the nice part about the Fed is they can control all that. So I think that uh, I actually think that the that it's smart to raise the rates, the short-term rates, because I think it'll help. Uh, I don't know. I feel like they got a handle on it this time because there's so many other positives going on. I really do. So I'm going to go back to, um, I remember when we were in shutdown mode um, and they couldn't cap oil production. I don't know if anybody followed this, but it was really amazing because if you have a well that is pumping out oil, it's not so easy just to put a plug in it and stop you know, uh, taking the oil, that oil keeps coming and you have to find a place to put it. So this phenomenon of people putting oil into tankers and just paying them to sit outside the port because they had no place to store them caused the cost of an oil tanker to go up like 11 fold. So like the rent for an oil tanker, it's 10,000 a day. It went to 110,000 a day because 
no, there was no consumption, right? The market was incredibly imbalanced. But at that time when oil was selling for $30 a barrel or whatever the ridiculous low amount was today on the spot market, a year from now, it was selling at 45 and two years from then it was selling at 55. So the market was pricing in that it was going to go up. Now, ironically, right now, I think on uh, Thursday or Wednesday, oil was like 100, 110. But the futures, to buy a barrel in the future was at $90 a year from now. Two years from now was at $65 a barrel. Okay, so some of these things that go on, you know, they, 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 tri they trip us up. And if we get confused and we aren't grounded in a good foundational conversation with our clients, I, I think that, you know, absent having a, a, a conversation about what all these things mean, could cause us to lose a great listing that would potentially come on the market, or it could cause us to not be the trusted advisor that the public demands us to be. Because 10 years ago, we had access to the information and the keys to the house is now that's less relevant. You know, consumers think that they know everything, but they don't know, and we don't even know um, how to approach the discussion of, is this a bubble or not a bubble? Okay. The other thing, Rob, specific to interest rates that you brought up is it's the same with rates, what you're talking about, yeah. futures and stuff. So, for example, the reason the rates went up from the high twos to almost to into the fours now since the since pretty much the first of the year is because the Fed said they were going to be hiking rates six times, seven times. That's already in there. So now it's all about is it happening? Is it happening? Yesterday when they did it, the rates got about an eighth to a quarter because that's what's supposed to happen. So the markets react on that, just like unemployment. It's a consensus is to be this much unemployment. Oh, was this. And that makes the market move. The market's already reacted to this interest rate movement. So the buyers that are thinking, oh, the rates are going up, the rates have gone up. So because the, the market's already built that in there, they just have to follow through with, with continuing to raise. And if they don't raise, then they'll go up even higher. If they do raise, they'll start to taper down. And, and versus like the conversation about unemployment, right? And is unemployment, is strong employment or, or weak unemployment good or bad for housing, right? So when the unemployment number comes out, if there's strong employment and low unemployment, what happens is the interest rates go up and then the stocks go down because the, you know they don't like higher interest rates. But long-term for the economy, um, people with jobs buy more houses, right? They buy more stocks, they buy more products. That's ultimately good. So there's this like circular, uh, circular um, conundrum that goes on there when a, a number comes out, because if there was a tremendous amount of unemployment, who, who can afford to pay for houses, right? But yet, so, so it, the negative it economic news hurts rates and it changes the market. So you want positive economic news, that's for sure. Even if rates are, to your point, Rob, if rates are 12, but the economic news is great and everybody's buying houses, who cares? The issue is that you want to have that balance of where it doesn't mean you want people to have high rates, but it's all about what you're saying. It's about the economic news. That's what drives rates. And, and how about, um, I'm going to put this here, Bruce, because it feels like a bubble and I'm going to put public sentiment. Okay, because I think the public, if they make, if they bid on a house, right, and they lose and their agent tells them, their trusted agent who they believe says, you know what, there were 27 offers. You're, you weren't even in the top five, even though you paid, you offered 50,000 more, right? I'm going to go like this, Bruce. There must be a bubble. This is unsustainable. This is crazy, right? So the consumer confidence in those things have a lot to do with it. It really has a lot to do with it because it gives some insight as to, I was trying to see if there was any consumer confidence uh, uh, indexes out this week. There weren't, but they are once a month. I mean, there's a lot and that, that has a lot to do with it, especially in real estate. Hey, Rob, the auto report has something about consumer confidence and it has been, Huge. it's yeah. been declining um, at a pretty steady rate. Uh, because of the things that you just pointed out. You know, the, the thing that I tell my clients is, hey, if I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be here selling houses, okay? Because nobody has a crystal ball. So instead of us playing predictor of the future, because again, what does a buyer want? A buyer wants a bubble, right? So that's what they want to have happen. So as you're pointing out, the public sentiment leads down that road, even though there may not be any economic indicators that support that particular perspective, like you're just pointing, like you're pointing out in this whole endeavor we're doing today, um, is, is that the public sentiment is what uh, we as trusted advisor have to say, well, you don't really understand what you're talking about. 
Okay. Here's why. And I'll give you the reasons, right? And, and you run down the reasons that, hey, if things are going to appreciate at a 10% rate over the next year, uh, why wouldn't you buy a house now? Still a good time to buy one, right? And our job is to communicate that to them. So anyway, hope that was hopefully that was helpful. You're on mute, Rob. You're on mute, Rob. Oh, I said, um, I said the uncertainty and the inflation is what's causing, in my opinion, the drop in consumer confidence. And maybe it's a, you know, whatever side of the aisle you're on, I think, you know, our leaders aren't giving us a high level of confidence that things are being done correctly at the state and the federal levels. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's more of a referendum, the consumer confidence on the fact that a gallon of milk, a gallon of gas, and anything you buy at the store is is either not available or is, is hiked up, right? So, um, hang on. So um, those those are some of the things I think are influencing the consumer confidence, but I don't think consumer confidence and the um, trajectory for residential real estate are even closely tied. I think that, you know, there's still a fairly high institutional um, level of buying into residential housing, um, one family units, as well as rental apartments, meaning that the smart people with all the money think that housing is still a very bullish sector to be into, okay? There's actually an indicator called the HMI, which is the housing market indicator, Rob, and I'm, I'm pulled it up on my uh, screens here. So the, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's based, it's based upon, um, you know, consumer, it's based upon data on a scale of one to a hundred as to where people feel in terms of what's going on with the housing market. And uh, the all time high was 84 in December and it's 79 this, this month and it was 81 last month. So it's very small movement. It's not a, you're right. The housing market is different than the consumer confidence. It's, it's a different market, different indicator. Yep. So hold on. Um, so let's not, let's not confuse the fact that we're aggravated about not having products and having to pay more for gasoline. Um, I had actually, uh, you know, heard some converse, some commentary. Uh, I don't know if you could see I'm in my RV. I was driving a lot. I was listening to the business uh, channels. And, um, you know, there's some pretty strong arguments for inflation to probably be a eight to maybe eight to 16, 18 month um, problem. And then we're going to see it stabilize and get back to um, two to three percent levels. And um, they were making the argument by showing how the futures markets are all indicating it. Thus, the price of oil two years from now is substantially lower than the spot market. Okay, the spot market is there's a temporary shortage. I need, I need the product here. People are bidding it up, right? And then the longer market is showing that inflation is not going to be as big of a problem as we all feel today. You know, and we say COVID, Putin, whatever we say the reason is, um, but those things will work themselves out. And I do think we're going to get back to a more predictable marketplace where um, I don't think as much as I feel like it's, it's frothy, it's a bubble. I don't think that the facts, you know, hold out that it's a bubble. And even to Jay's point where, you know, Jeff Otto, who's really micro um, researching all these numbers, I mean, he's saying it might be a 5% correction in pricing. So it's possible that this year could be 10, it could be 12, it could be 14. 2024, Rob. Oh, yeah, 2024, right? That's in 2024. So, so, but I mean, like a 5% reduction in 2024, or even 2023 is not necessarily bad, and it's not a bubble, okay? And um, for, for us who are on this call on a Friday morning, um, this is going to eliminate a lot of the fringe players out of the real estate market that don't know what they're doing and they're malpracticing. And, mm -hmm. and we've all had transactions where it, somebody just got their license. They're with some discount broker who gives them nothing. They don't know what they're doing. We have to do all the work so that they can get paid. Anybody feel my pain here? Right? I mean, they're out there. Yeah, those, pe those, those people are going to be washed out of the marketplace and the, the people who are on these calls who are investing in themselves will see their 
business increase and their market share increase t- tremendously if the market softens a little bit because all those fringe players are gone. It's going to be slightly easier for us to conduct business when the fringe players are out. It's going to be a lot more profitable for us. It's going to be a lot more fulfilling, a lot more sustainable when that happens. Okay. So look, you know, the market's never easy. You always have to deal with changes and, and um, shocks that we didn't anticipate, but I don't really see a 2007, eight catastrophic collapse. And I, I don't call a 5% correction in price a bubble under any circumstance. And for, it seems like, and I'm gonna to talk to you, Bruce, it seems like most of the people on this call have never really been in a um, buyer's market. And they're like, wow, I would give my left arm to be able to show somebody six houses or eight houses in one day, right? But you know what? When that happens, you're gonna be like, oh my God. I'm, buyers. Oh my God, I'm driving around I'm driving around the whole state. These people, you know, they don't want to make a decision because there's so much inventory. Right? So mark my words, we will be having this conversation at some point where people are like, oh, if I can only have that market where you could say you have one house to buy, put your offer in. Right? That was such a great market. Now there's all these houses and they can buy anything. So be careful what you wish for. A little bit when more was balance. The last one? Was that six years ago? When, when was the last one? It was probably about six, what was it, seven, eight years ago? When was the last time it was like that? I can't even remember. It was 2011. Probably, was it that? Yeah. It was that was that long ago? 11 years ago. Jesus. Wow. Hey, Rob. Assume yep. we forget. Yep. Rob, this is Scott Walker. Hey, Scott. Um, I'd like to, uh, I w- hey, I would just like to add, you know, this market is so different than any other market that we've ever encountered because in this market now we have the institutional buyer and that speculation is really, you know, changed the market dynamics uh, in a way that we've never really seen. I think that I'm looking forward to the point in time when that institutional buyer is going to be saying, time to sell and i'm wondering what the dynamics will be at that point in time define institutional bar you mean like entities picking up multiple properties scott yeah flips uh pools and fires reits all of those things that have entered the market that we never really had in the residential single family market they always existed in the condominium the you know the uh the project backed um like the the multi you know, housing the, segments, the multifamilies and the commercial buildings. But you have they, companies that own hundreds of houses. <clears throat> so Bruce, does does um, Blackstone or, or BlackRock still have our, our firm? Our former yeah, our our, our largest stock owner is uh, had the largest amount of single family homes owned in the country. So I mean, typically Black, Blackstone. Yeah, typically what they would do is they would buy it during a recession, to be quite candid. But you're right. There is a lot of products. uh, But I think the difference, Scott, and I'm not suggesting that it wouldn't continue, but I think the only difference is that, you know, the fix and flip product versus the retention product, the fix and flip product kind of absorbs itself, right? But the retention product is a really good point. I think the only thing that makes it complicated to gauge that, because I asked that same question on on a national call recently that I was part of. We've never had a market where... The, the, the problem is that there's no problem. The good news is that rental values are going through the roof as well because we have a population issue. There's so many people that there's just more people that need housing than there is housing. So nobody really knows the answer to that, but that's a really good point. But those, they're all, you know, when it starts to change, when the rental market changes, then I guess we'll get some flavor on that. But right now it doesn't seem like it's, there's still more people that need it. So I don't know where that top is, but that's a great question. I asked that same question. We never seen a market like this. We haven't. I think there's, it's going to come. I think there's another component. Uh, It's Colleen from Florida. We're not seeing the overbuilding that we had seen during the last bubble. Because of the cost to build right now and the shortage of building supplies, uh, the building uh, industry has really slowed down quite a bit. The new construction. So, Colleen, Colleen well, we have a we have we have some there were some stats that came out this morning for February. New home permits were 1.8 million. They were uh, down 1.9 percent for February, but up 7.7 percent year over year. New home starts were 1.7 million. They were 6.8 higher 
for the month, but new home starts were 22% increase year over year, but completions 1.3 million were down five and year over year completions are 3% less each year. So it is a lot slower. You're noticing the starts are there, but they're, they're having a hard time getting them done as quick because of those supply chains, but the starts are still there. So eventually they'll get done. So Co Colleen, um, Zillow was buying in Florida, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, when they uh, abandoned their program and started to, uh, I'm going to call fire sale their inventory to get out of that segment. Um, did you see any impact on, you know, that multi-billion dollar um, fire sale of homes or not really? Not no. really. No. On the contrary, no. no. So, so I think, I think yeah. the market so is so, to... the market's so, sorry, um, it, it's, the market is uh, so in balance that, you know, institutions getting into financial trouble forced to sell doesn't influence the direction or even the price of the market. Yeah, so what, going back to what Jay was saying when he said he hasn't seen this before, Rob, one thing we didn't take into consideration, you can't take it into consideration because it's an anomaly, is force majeure. We didn't plan for COVID. That was the beginning of everything that we're at today. Nobody planned for force majeure and having COVID and it's for directionally being in the direction it is today. So I think when you talk about the HMI and all of that, it's hard to tell because you have a lot of moving pieces that are the acting mother of God. Right? COVID, now this Ukraine war that is dictating the market, you say it doesn't, but it actually does. Well, I mean, everything everything has uh, some impact, you know, um, and uh, look, if, if this great discussion here does anything, um, I think it highlights the fact that you know, if we have buyers on the sideline waiting for the massive bubble to burst, um, we probably have a obligation to share with them that that the facts don't don't support that. And if we ourselves are absolutely, are, if we ourselves are losing offers or we're enlisting and we're getting uh, an unridic a ridiculous amount of offers coming and that's almost unmanageable, and that makes us feel like the market's frothing in for a bubble. I just don't think the facts mm -hmm. support that. Okay. And I think the that facts don't support that. We need to. Because what need... the news wants to show you puts you in a panic. And so all you see is a panic, and our clients are in a panic. It's up to us as the experts to dial them back and say, okay, let's review. Let's talk about this. Whatever their goal is or whatever they're trying to buy or where, you know, their destination, I think it's up to us as the experts to dial that back because all they're seeing all day long is the negative. They're not seeing, those, you know, very small percentile, Rob are watching the things that, you know, we are watching when it comes to finance and so forth at six, five, you know, four o'clock all the way up until four o'clock in the afternoon. They're not seeing that side. They're only seeing the mainstream side. So, so for a buyer that might be a little panicked by, you know, the circumstance that they're in with multiple offers, if the market's likely to go up 10 or 12% in the next year, and for crying out loud, you need a house and you're getting a, a near historically low interest rate. Like we need to ground them and bring them to those facts. And we, we can't mm -hmm. ignore, we can't ignore you know, some of these other facts, but it just seems like, you know, in totality, you know, when you look at this thing in, in its completeness, the, you know, argument for a housing bubble is very, very low. I mean, you know, we have people. The other buying. part to the housing bubble, Rob, is that they, the rents are the rents are high too. There's so many borrowers. Easy to validate it because they can't. I have so many borrowers that we speak to when you when you speak to the points that were just mentioned. It's easy for them to get it. People, the rents are ridiculous because there's a demand for that as well. So it, they get it when you explain it to them. They get it because they see it. I mean, it's just. The rents are crazy too. It's not like it used to be that. Oh, we we're trying to convince them to buy, but rent was so low. That's not happening now. That's interesting, Bruce. We, we need to create a futures market for housing. So I say, hey, this house here is six seventy five today. If you wait a year, it's going to be seven ninety, and then if you wait two years, it'll go back to seven sixty five. But in the meantime, you have no place to live. How smart are you? Yeah. But I mean, um, I, look at I, you know. There's some great. I think points. the other point. Go ahead, Colleen. The other point uh, is with the cost of the rentals, uh, the buyers are not totally stupid. <laughs> they see that it's much more 
beneficial to purchase than to rent. It will cost them less to buy, even with the inflated prices, than to rent. Our, our rents in Florida are the highest in the country. I mean, right. they're they're absolutely insane. So, Colleen, when you said so, are- it's it's pushing it's pushing our market so, even more so, towards so, purchase. So, Colleen, when you said buyers aren't totally stupid, you said that in jest, and I know you did. But um, the the, yes. the 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 interesting piece about that is, um, you know, buyers, you know, can you know, buyers are looking for us, not just to tell them what the rent is or what the price is of a home today, but they're looking at us now for a little bit more information. And I for think the if, solution. Yeah, and 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 the the solution is, it, it, and it's not just you know, hey, it's rosy. The prices are going to go up forever, but you know, some of this information, like being in the market, I didn't even think about some of the stuff Lindsay presented. And was there anything that we didn't cover, um, Sharon, that Lindsay had on those slides? If you're still on with us, so uh, I am here. I actually put all the I put all the statistics in the chat box. Okay. Um, let me, uh, you want to just tell us a couple of them there? Them? Yes, just read a couple of them to us because, um, those were yeah, by I and large think, bullish. Uh, yeah, I, I think the reality that the 34, 34% of the buyers were first time home buyers. Um, and that ties in with all those millennials getting into the picture, uh, who have not reached the average age of a first time home buyer yet. So that 34% is going to be significantly higher very near in the future. Um, and then um, sellers are living in their homes for a lesser time frame. Um, they're only staying in their current homes for eight years. And that was the biggest drop since 1985. Uh, sales to investors and cash sales, I think we already covered are significantly up between um, the two years, 2020 to 2021. And then I put together some New Jersey stats, uh, which back up auto's findings as well. Um, new listings at 20% down, median sales price and average sales price, nine to 10% higher, days on market down 9%. But the biggest statistic, I think the most powerful is New Jersey only has 1.7 months of supply on the market right now. So, which is 29% lower than the previous year. And, and, and we went into, um, we went into this, um, the COVID uh, pandemic now, maybe endemic, um, in a hot market going into it, and it just exasperated it. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, look at, you know, yeah. um, our clients don't look at us just to, to show them the comps because they can probably find comps themselves. They don't need us to see most of the inventory. They need us for this information, folks. Like they need us for that um, uh, discussion and that not guarantee, but the assessment of where the market is and why you know it's probably a good thing to invest in. I mean, I think it's 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 less risky than the stock market, and you got a place to live, you know. And um, inflation, when you put ten percent down. Inflation goes up on the whole 100% of the property you buy, not just the 10% down payment. That's massive, right? When you buy a stock, okay, you, even if you leverage it 50%, number one, you're, bar, you're paying to borrow the money and you're only getting uh, a two to one impact on your inflation or your appreciation. So let's take this information. I'll have Fred uh, post this on our YouTube channel with the, uh, the data here. And I'm sure that there's more data that I'll be adding to it. But this was a really robust, healthy conversation about something I think we all have in the back of our mind, which hopefully now we can communicate a little bit better. Any, any final comments before we wrap it up? Well, I gotta say for everybody that participated, excellent job and a special, um, Thanks to Charon and uh, Jay for sharing your in your insight. All right, have a, a great weekend. The the, the uh, sky isn't falling. Thank you, Rob. It was very informative.
Yeah, Greg, thanks for spending an hour with Excellent. us here. Excellent, Excellent information. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Rose, it was Anybody a lot of people. Slides, slides, just email me. I'm sorry, Jay, what were you saying, Jay? Jay? I just said, if anybody wants the slide from the, from the auto report to send to their clients, just email me and I'll, I'll get them over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jay. Jay, send, the, send uh, one of us your invite, though, by email, so we can push it out. Uh, I'll, Please. Put it, I'll, I'll put Jay, I'll, uh, I'll put it in the, um, in the slides here if anybody wants it to request from Jay. All right. But yeah, I mean, I send, I send it to clients who want to tell me that there's a bubble. I go, here. Here's the dad. Leave me alone. So, 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 <laughs> well done. So. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. This was a really um, informative and collaborative event that I think we all got a lot of value out of. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Rob.